Welcome to Virtual Book Signing. I'm Daniel Weinberg, and as usual, we're here at the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop in Chicago. And you're not because you can't make it in, because it's snowing where you are, or too cold, or you're just home with your margarita and you just don't want to come out. So we appreciate your being here, and all of you have braved the elements today to come out as well. We appreciate that, too. Well, uh, this is a wonderful occasion, as far as I'm concerned, uh, to have Edmund Morris here, uh, a self-described African-American was born in Kenya and immigrated first to London and then to the U.S. in 1968, a uh, tumultuous year to have come around here. Uh, the first book that he wrote, uh, The Rise of Theodore Roosevelt, won a Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award in 1980. Uh, this, his second book of the trilogy uh, won the L.A. Times Book Prize for Biography in 2002. That's Theodore Rex, and we happen to have uh, some first editions as well uh, available. If you'd like to grab one while we still have them, they're in uh, as new condition. Uh, so you can get that too. Other books of Mr. Morris have been Dutch, a memoir of Ronald Reagan, and a, a wonderful little book called Beethoven, the Universal Composer. His latest book completes his Teddy Roosevelt uh, trilogy uh, 30 years later, uh, Colonel Roosevelt. It's a random house book and we appreciate their sending uh, Mr. Morris here. 766 pages and it's illustrated and it's $35 and not a bad book for a stocking stuffer uh, for any history buff. Well, uh, let's get right into this. Uh, yesterday, uh, the Chicago Tribune uh, had an article on the three books on the trilogy itself and on you. Uh, they call Colonel Roosevelt uh, a record of denouement. Well, I don't think Roosevelt or you would call these last years denouement. Tell us what you're, what you're covering in this book for, uh, for our readers out here, our listeners, and also why it's called Colonel Roosevelt. Yes, I can't say I'm crazy about the word denouement myself. It implies a diminishment, a dim, dis, dis, I can't talk tonight, <laughs> diminishment or a diminution, uh, which was certainly not the case. He, uh, in fact, expanded, effloresced, became richer and more full of um, contradictory aspects. So in other words, he became more and more biographically fascinating, um, revealing, for example, depths of intellectualism that I was not aware of. I'd always been aware of the fact that his intellect was broad, that his culture was, ex was staggeringly broad, but the depth, philosophical depth that he reached in some of some remarkable essays published in 1911, 1912. I'd never been aware of before until I wrote this book. Also, his scope for physical adventures expanded. So by the time I came to the end of the book, I felt it was richer in substance, really, than any other period of his life. I don't think he expected to die. I think he was going to go on working on and for night. Oh, no, he did. He knew he was going to die at 60, and always said he would die at 60. Mm -hmm. Even when he graduated from Harvard, doctor examined him, and he was then a scrawny boy with a lot of asthma and rheumatic tendencies, heart problems. But the doctor said to him, Theodore, you're going to have to lead a sedentary life, a scholarly life, for which you're suited. And T.R. said, Doctor, I am not. I'm going to do everything you tell me not to. I'm going to climb mountains. I'm going to live vigorously. I'm going to punch cattle. And I'm going to die at 60, which he did very obligingly, <laughs> for his future biographer. If he'd gone on beyond 1919, I think I'd have had to write another volume. <laughs> I'm happy to have had you here for a fourth volume in another 10 years, probably. Uh, let me ask you this. Um, from de Tocqueville to Cowardine, who wrote on Lincoln, uh, nine Americans have viewed and assessed America as leaders and as people both. What, if any, special perspective can a foreign observer yourself from the beginning, even though you're here now, uh, bring to an American personality like Teddy Roosevelt. Your British and your Kenyan background must lead you to an understanding of an American leader like Roosevelt, a little different than what we would have here. I suppose uh, in writing about him, which I began to do in 1975, I did hope to educate myself in the, in the culture of my adopted country the history, obviously, of his life and times, but also the culture, American culture. 
And it's, it struck me at the time, and still does strike me, that he's one of the most quintessentially American personalities who's ever lived. And to study him is to study the United States. Study the fact that he himself, as a young man, a patrician New Yorker of privileged background, Harvard education, felt the need to go west and live with cowboys and experience the rougher parts of life, to build up his Eastern heritage with a Western acquisition and make himself a rounded president of all the people. Well, he came to that. Uh, he had an amazing background, as your first two books tell us and bring us to this. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he did expand into so many different areas that he maybe didn't have a chance to do that before. Uh, quickly, why Colonel Roosevelt? Why the name, the title? Well, he, he did not like being called Mr. President once he left the White House. He'd had two substantial and very successful terms, but when newsmen began to address him afterwards as his customary, as Mr. President, he said, um, it's not my title anymore. But, he said, if you must call me anything, Colonel Roosevelt would be nice because um, I feel that I won the title in battle in the Spanish-American War when he charged up San Juan Heights, and um, he felt it was a title he'd earned for life. So for the rest of his life, he was the Colonel, Colonel Roosevelt, and he loved that title. Uh, is there any overriding theme that you have uh, found yourself placed in through these three books, or does each book itself, you think, has a, a little different theme as far as Roosevelt is concerned? Well, each book has got a sort of subdued metaphorical structure. Um, for example, the rise of Theodore Roosevelt has the rather obvious metaphor running through it of hills, mountains. In every chapter, practically, he's climbing this or that eminence, the Matterhorn, San Juan Hill, Sagamore Hill, his own house, his own, um, yes, his own house. It ends with him on Mount Marcy, the highest point of New York State, vice president, hearing the news that he's become president of the United States. So these themes, this theme of hills runs all the way through. And Theodore Rex has a metaphor of, of railroad journeys. He was constantly steaming back and forth across the United States. A lot of the, of the imagery employed in descriptions of him as president, uh, they called him a steam engine in trousers. He gave off propulsive steam-like energy. So that runs through the second book. And the third book, um, I don't know if there's a continuous metaphor, but it is a tragedy. Even though his personality expanded, it is a story of personal tragedy, and it ends very sadly. Um, give us a, a thought. Let's, let's think about the living guy again. Uh, what were his mannerisms through life? What was he like? How did people view him in that regard, physically? He had mannerisms by the score. In fact, um, his great-grandson, Archibald Roosevelt Jr., once said to me, Edmund, I just read your first book, and he said, all these mannerisms I thought were my own, I find that I inherited from my great-grandfather. <laughs> uh, Archie, this, this one I'm talking about, had exactly the same mannerisms, the flashing the teeth and the wrinkling up the eyes, the falsetto voice, the propulsive, punchy gestures, the quickness, and also the bright intelligence. But T.R. was so rich in mannerisms and eccentricities, physical ones, that I think if he was alive now, he would burst every television screen in the country. <laughs> he was just, um, somebody once said, I, I felt nervous sitting next to him because he seemed he was going to burst out of his clothes. <laughs> um, there are many presidential polls in this country, as you've seen over the years. Uh, in 2009, C-SPAN had a poll rating the presidents, and TR came in fourth mm. behind Washington, Lincoln, and uh, his cousin, FDR. Um, or some polls I think put Lin Lincoln I think, first. I think Lincoln came first. In some polls, it was an anomaly all of a sudden. I think it was an anomaly that uh, Washington came first on one really? poll. Uh. Yes. But Lincoln is usually right there, we, mm. we're happy to say. Uh, is this a fair assessment of TR? Yes, I think so. After he died, he was routinely bracketed at number three after Washington, Lincoln, Theodore Roosevelt. And in the C-SPAN poll that I remember, it was um, <coughs> Abraham Lincoln, Washington, Franklin Roosevelt, 
and TR at number four. So for at least a decade after his death, 1919 to 1930, TR was assumed to be the third greatest president who ever lived. And then in 1930, a man called Henry Pringle wrote a very iconoclastic, very funny, brilliantly written book, which completely debunked him, destroyed his historical reputation practically overnight, presented a caricature of him as an overgrown adolescent, militaristic, and all these things. And although the book was actually superficially researched, it was effective, and his reputation tumbled and didn't really begin to rise again until the late 1950s when he celebrated his centennial. From then onward, his reputation among serious historians and in the bosom of the American people has steadily increased, to the point that um, in the 1970s, university professors were saying to each other, sell Woodrow Wilson, buy Theodore Roosevelt. <laughs> <laughs> and now he shows up at number four, which I think is more or less where he deserves to be. Mm. Oh, you think FDR should be number three? I do, yeah. He handled bigger issues. Mm. T.R. was the only one of our great presidents who didn't have to handle a war. Clinton, I know, wanted to be an A president, but he didn't have his war either. And, and so he never got what he wished to have, I think. Uh, he didn't he wanted to lead us to war, but the greatness that he hoped to get to in that regard. He may be great in other areas, but I think Clinton went through that. a period of channeling T.R. Most presidents do. They all go through their Rooseveltian phase. But Clinton <laughs> suddenly became Mr. Environment and started riding horses out west and <laughs> went through a Theodore Roosevelt phase. I was asked by the new... I was asked, sorry? Not a bad person to uh, be inspired by. Oh, sure. Everybody likes to identify with a winner. <laughs> Clinton, in fact, the New York Times asked me when Clinton was running for re-election in 1994, I think it was, to write an op-ed piece comparing him to Theodore Roosevelt, who ran for a re-election in 1904. So what I did was I took a page of Clinton's rhetoric from his book, From Hope to History, which Clinton claimed to have written himself. And I compared it for intellectual content, just content, with a page of Theodore Roosevelt's document, his campaign document of 1904, and found that Clinton's language was something like 67% air, words that had no meaning. Uh, idle metaphors, cliches. It was only something like 38% hard content on the page. TR's was 97% hard content. So it was an uh, interesting comparison of two inter famously intelligent men, one of whom was a substantial. Well, I had a childhood impression of him, oddly enough. When I was growing up in Kenya at the age of 10, I came across a civic history of Nairobi, my hometown which happened to have a photograph of this famous American president that had come to Nairobi in 1909, uh, having left the White House, and had embarked on a gigantic safari for the Smithsonian Institution. And something about the photograph of this guy, this famous American with his teeth, <coughs> this superabundance of teeth, and this great mustache and the pith helmet, he just looked like fun. I remember thinking as a small boy, gee, I'd like to hang out with that American president. He looks like his <laughs> butt. And uh, I'd forgot about that image completely for the next 25 years until I was here living in the United States in 1975 when Nixon resigned the White House and began to quote Theodore Roosevelt. That's when the impression came back into my head. Curiosity surged up and I began to want to find out about him found that he was God's own biographical subject, and here I am 30 years later. <laughs> well, you said that uh, I've been following you on the, uh, on the uh, television circuit that you've been on, and uh, I feel almost like Boswell here to ask you about yourself, too, in these questions. But you stated how surprised you were when you got to uh, TR's writings, how good they really were. Mm. Now, I once owned The Wilderness Hunter, uh, that was inscribed by Roosevelt. Among the books I have written, this is the one I like best. Mm. Then a number of years later, I got in a letter of his writing to someone 
saying that another book was really his, uh, <laughs> the book that he liked the most. So what book do you, here is, here is his African Game Trails, very well known, a That's first edition. That's the luxury edition. Yes, exactly. And not the signed uh, two volume, there's two volume uh, limited mm. edition, but this is the luxury edition, uh, as you say, that they put out. Then there's a trade edition, of course. Yeah. And it, I think it sold quite a bit. This is the first, though. Um, so among the books that he read, what do you think he really did like the best of his own writing? Well, he wrote 40 books. And um, I would say that he probably liked his, his hunting trilogy the best. But my personal opinion is that um, through the Brazilian wilderness that he wrote late in life after his famous expedition down the river of Dart in Brazil. I think that contains his best writing. Mm -hmm. There are some pages in it which are prose at its most perfect. Transparent, unaffected, metaphorically original, uh, with a strong auditory quality. This is something that distinguishes all his nature books, his books about the natural world. Fantastic auditory sensitivity, ability to render sounds of nature, bird calls, animal cries. He had this extrasensory dimension, which probably related to the fact he was so myopic when he was young. He recognized birds by their sound rather than by sight. So his um, nature writing is delicious in that respect. Did he ever record that? <coughs> did he himself try to mimic? He birds? did. It's a, it's a very acute question of yours. He tried to notate bird calls mm -hmm. in a queer auditory language of his own with strange syllables, which meant something to him. The lines um, hiccuping up and down and extensions, a kind of calligraphy of sound. But he never put that onto tape of some sort. No, time. no, it was the technology was too primitive. Yeah, it was primitive, but yeah. could have heard it nonetheless. Mm. Um, so you think the Brazilian is now as far as auditory? Did he, did he also? How did he write? What was his writing methods? Uh, did he have a time of day that he wrote? Uh, all the time, or did he uh, vary? How did he get all that writing in with the busy life politically and otherwise? What did he do? He was one of these 19th century f writing, uh, right, one of these 19th century machines that was just superhumanly productive. There were so many men of that quality in those days, and women, for example, Georges Sand would stop, would finish a novel at one o'clock in the morning and would immediately turn over the page and write the prologue to her next novel. Uh, Franz Liszt, who's the most productive composer of the 19th century, wrote over a thousand musical works, wrote 2,000 letters every year on top of everything else. So it was not abnormal to be like T.R. to be that productive. He wrote 150,000 letters, 40 books, countless magazine articles. And the secret to his productivity was, in the first place, he always had servants, <laughs> which yeah. helps. And in the second place, he used every minute of the day. If he was waiting for a carriage for three minutes, he would either write something in a notebook or he would read a few pages of a book. So he used every second of the day and was phenomenally productive as a result. Well, talking about research methods, uh, actually, I have a question here that has been echoed uh, from... Uh, uh, Dave in Terre Haute. Uh, you know, the computer wasn't here when you began this project 30 years ago. Uh, we just had Ron Chernow in, uh, who says he still used cards uh, to write his, his books. Uh, so Dave asked, did your research methods change from the first book to the last? And how did you organize your research? No, my methods didn't change at all. And like Ron, I use cards. Mm -hmm. I've got yards and yards of cards. <laughs> In fact, I have a desk which I had made specially for me with two pull-out drawers, each of which contains a yard, of, two yards of cards. So I've got four yards of cards altogether. That's just what uh, Ron Chernow does. Does he really? Yes. And he can it's lay them all out. Yeah, chronological. And he has them in drawers. Yeah. And he can lay them out uh, so we can see. And then he also then has them in, uh, he can then see visually where he's missing material. Yeah, exactly. You can see the topography of a life. Once, <laughs> once you have the life pretty well documented in cards, with the little um, tabs sticking up for major episodes. So 
So if you look, uh, I, I once did a Ronald Reagan's life. I had an enormous selection of cards. I must have had about 10 yards of cards representing all Ronald Reagan's life. And if you look over this topography, you can see where his life began to grow in importance. The achievements began to multiply and grow enormous in the presidency and then rapidly decline when he got Alzheimer's down to almost nothing at the end. And um, if you show a biographical subject this kind of thing, it can be quite shocking to them <laughs> to see how they waxed and waned. <laughs> now, you don't get that kind of three-dimensional feel for a character working on a computer. All you get on a computer is one item at a time on the screen, or a few. But with cards or with manuscripts, you can see the totality of everything. You can get a spatial feel for it which I think is vital to the shaping of a book. Yeah, the topography, as you say. Uh, what were your richest sources for this, for all three of the books, uh, let alone this last one? What were your richest sources and maybe uh, new ones that you've been able to obtain? The richest sources were his own letters and books, of course. Um, he documented himself so thoroughly. His daughter, Alice, used to tease him for writing posterity letters. <laughs> Whenever Dad did something important, he would write a very long posterity letter, and he would send it to one of his children, and he would sign it, Theodore Roosevelt, <laughs> as though they didn't know what his name was. <laughs> now, I'm going to ask you, a because we're book people here, and we'd like to know how books are produced. Uh, this, this has had an interesting history, your trilogy of uh, Teddy Roosevelt. The first one, of course, uh, was uh, Theodore Rex and uh, I mean, uh, the rise of uh, Theodore Roosevelt. But after that one, and it won a Pulitzer, then we book dealers waited, 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 and the second volume didn't come out. And it, it was reported at the time, I mean, I heard this, true or no, that you felt somewhat blocked in getting into that second volume. In the meantime, you then uh, were taken in to the White House with uh, Ronald Reagan, and you, um, you wrote Dutch through that. Now, on Face the Nation a couple weeks ago, you mentioned that you felt somewhat blocked uh, about American politics, especially presidential politics. Mm. And that, I think, maybe now that I've seen uh, I heard this. Now I understand perhaps why that took a while for you to get to that second volume until you had an understanding. Did being in Ronald Reagan's White House help that understanding? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I'd started to write Theodore X more or less immediately after finishing um, the rise of Theodore Roosevelt, 1980, 1981, the year Reagan was elected and became president. But because I had now to write about Theodore Roosevelt's presidential politics. I began to have difficulties simply because I didn't understand how the White House worked. I've never been particularly interested in politics per se. I like to write about lives, biography, the writing of life. So um, when I had this opportunity to become Reagan's biographer and go into the White House and watch power in action and watch the president in action, I learned and learned and learned and uh, was able to go back to the TR after that. Um, with, with a real understanding of how the White House worked. Well, now that we're in the White House years for a moment, did he create the imperial presidency? Well, he was an imperialist, and he was president, so if you want to combine your information, <laughs> it's, it's fine by me. How do you I've always it? mistrusted labels. Um, he was an imperialist, certainly in his pre-presidential phase. As president, he was surprisingly um, willing to give, give away territory that we had acquired during the Spanish-American War. We gave Cuba its independence within a year and a half of becoming president, so that the totality of our overseas possessions shrank during his presidency. He couldn't wait to give independence to the Philippines. And he became a consummate diplomat uh, who mediated a foreign war and received the Nobel Peace Prize. So I think uh, his imperialism, as you call it, evaporated pretty damn quickly after he became president. What brought him to that? Why did he feel that he didn't want to be uh, imperialist at all after that? And how did he feel then about World War I when it came? Well, he felt about World War I very much the same way that Woodrow Wilson did when it came in 1914. 
Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson was a, was a pacifist who was determined to keep the United States neutral, and TR supported the president in that uh, stance until a few traumatic things happened that changed his attitude. In the first place, the Germans overrode the university city of Louvain in Belgium and burned the most priceless medieval library in Europe. It was an act of deliberate barbarism. And they, within a few weeks later, destroyed the medieval cathedral of Reims. So these two barbaric acts by the German military machine turned TR's uh, attitude to the war radically. And then when in May of 1915 the Lusitania was sunk by a German submarine with the deaths of many Americans aboard, that's what really convinced him that Western democracy was under threat in Europe, that German militarism, which he'd seen him with his own eyes in 1910, uh, sitting on a charger next to the Kaiser at the field of Doberitz, watched the German army in exercise. And even then, he'd said to his wife that night, we're in for it. A catastrophe is coming. So by 1915, he was an ardent interventionist and wanted the United States to get into this war. Now, of course, the Zimmerman telegram was a part of that story. Mm -hmm. uh, just to let everyone know, if you don't remember, uh, that there was a diplomatic proposal by Germany to Mexico uh, to make war against the United States. Uh, the proposal was declined by Mexico, uh, but it angered Americans. Is one part that led uh, America into war. What was uh, TR's reaction to that? I wouldn't be surprised, Dan, if you haven't got a copy of that telegram in your collection, knowing uh, you. If I did, that would be nice. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it would be dry by now, too, by the way. <laughs> no, by then it was no surprise to him. This telegram, which was a patent, made it patently obvious that Germany was trying to get Mexico and Japan into a war with the United States. By then, TR was already so much a determined interventionist, it made very little difference, except to convince him he was right. And that's when he went to beg Woodrow Wilson to be allowed to lead a division of American volunteer soldiers to Europe uh, with himself as major general in charge and to die gloriously in battle. Was that kind of a misunderstanding on TR's part into, uh, into the nature of the, of the, or that led to the war? Did he really expect to be brought in as a colonel uh, charging up uh, some German hill? Oh, he seriously wanted to go into the war, and he, he had already accumulated um, an enormous recruitment of soldiers from all over the United States who wanted to serve under him, aware of the fact that he had been a professional soldier in his time. And, but what, of course, he didn't understand was war had changed radically by the time um, World, War II, World War I broke out. It had become brutal and mechanized and universal, and he still thought of it in terms of cavalry charges, and romance. Oh, so so this notion... the beginning of the war, of course. Uh, there were cavalry charges uh, in there in Europe. Uh, so war was changing, and they still didn't know that either. Yes, but the cavalry charges were sliced apart. They by learned this. quickly, yes. Yeah. So um, his notion was romantic, and Woodrow Wilson was quite right in denying him this privilege that he begged for so desperately. And his only compensation was to send his four sons to the war in his stead, expressing the rather sick hope that one of them, if not all of them, might get wounded and perhaps killed and die gloriously in his stead. Yet when one did, what was his reaction? When one did, the youngest and the brightest, the one most like himself, Quentin Roosevelt, was killed in July of 1918, shot down in a dogfight over French soil. Uh, TR fell apart physically and emotionally, just like that. Because all his notions of romance, romantic warfare, evaporated at that moment. There's a picture in my book, Colonel Roosevelt, of Quentin. It's never been published before, of Quentin lying beside his broken plane dead as a steer fallen off a hook. And the impact of that on his father was so catastrophic that it was foreordained that TR would not last much longer himself. He had a bumpy relationship with some of his children. Uh, and I have here uh, Nixon's memoirs, strangely enough, in which uh, he has a, uh, a book plate in there uh, that he gave this to 
Alice Roosevelt Longworth with appreciation for her friendship and wise counsel over the years. This is in uh, May of 1978 that Nixon gave this to uh, T.R.'s daughter. Uh, my impression when I purchased this book was that the moment Nixon blinked, she threw that over her shoulder. Uh, is that true? Well, no, I don't think she disliked him. In fact, I had the misapprehension that she probably would have disliked him just because Nixon was so different from her. But my wife, who's the supreme authority of all matters to do with presidential <laughs> wives, assures me that Alice kind of liked Nixon and admired his political smarts. So I heard that there was actually a relationship that they had, not a great friendship one, but one that uh, certainly was different than the one I expected them to have had. Mm. Um, do you think that if Roosevelt, instead of Wilson, had occupied the White House, uh, could war in Europe have been averted? It certainly could have been um, delayed and perhaps shortened and maybe even averted for the simple reason that Theodore Roosevelt was in 1914, or should I say in 1912 when the presidential election took place and Wilson won. Theodore Roosevelt came second as the Bormuz candidate and William Howard Taft, the incumbent president, lost. If TR had been elected president, we would have had in the White House a true cosmopolitan who knew personally practically every one of the crowned heads of Europe who were at war with one another. He knew these men. He'd stayed in their palaces. He corresponded with them. He spoke their languages, German and French. He could read in Italian. Uh, he had a Nobel Peace Prize in his pocket. He was the most famous man in the world in 1910 when he came out of Africa. And with his prestige and with his understanding of foreign cultures, which by the way extended to Islam and Jap Japanese culture as well as the others, no one in the world could have been better placed to negotiate a peace between the contending powers of Europe than TR. Instead we had a president who was a Virginia preacher, a Presbyterian, ill-traveled, completely uninterested in foreign policy, interested rather in large cerebral issues of constitutional and congressional politics, not a man of the world. So um, the history of, of, the, of those days is, 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 is set in stone, but I think TR in, in the White House would have been a force for peace and probably would have averted that war. Uh, you mentioned his Nobel Peace Prize, and Lawton from uh, our broadcast here uh, just emailed in, what does it say about a man who wins both the Nobel Peace Prize and the Medal of Honor? Well, he won the Medal of Honor belatedly under President Clinton, and I must say I, I, I'd never approved of that. The truth of the matter is that TR was a very brave soldier in, World War, in, in the Spanish-American War. And everybody who was under him uh, recognized the fact that, he was, that his bravery was extraordinary, the Battle of San Juan Hill. But it so happened that the army in the Spanish, time of the Spanish-American War, for some strange reason, instituted draconian standards of qualification for the Medal of Honor, making it almost impossible to win. So in fact, there were hardly any Medals of Honor that came out of that war. And TR, after the war, campaigned for it in the only ungentlemanly behavior of his career, in my opinion. He pulled strings, he lobbied, he said he deserved it, he wanted it, and he never got it. Because he, by the same criteria, very few people did get it. The family lobbied for the next century, and they finally got it out of Clinton, a posthumous award. And I don't think it was deserved. But he has it, so he's going down in history yeah. that way. It was, a it was a sentimental award, and sentimentality is a dangerous luxury. For? In questions of honor. Mm -hmm. If TR got the award from President Clinton, then all the other men who were as brave as he was should have gotten it too. Uh, Sheldon doesn't say where he's from, but I think from the District of Columbia. What were TR's view of the Supreme Court? both while he was president as well as before and after. What were Tio's uh, views of the Supreme, of the Supreme Court? Court? Yes. 
Well, he expected the Supreme Court to endorse all these presidential executive acts. He was extremely upset when they didn't. He couldn't understand why a judge should have a different opinion from himself. He appointed Justice uh, William uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes with the express purpose of having the justice support all these antitrust policies as president. And when in the famous Northern Securities suit, which TR personally authorized, the first big antitrust lawsuit in our history, when Justice Holmes came out to dissent it against the, the, um, the case, TR was outraged, couldn't believe that Holmes should be so disloyal as to contradict his policy. They made it up later and began to respect each other, but TR's view of the, ju of the judiciary was strictly that of a practicing um, politician. Well, another, uh, another politician that he had uh, some truck with was <coughs> William Howard Taft, and they had an, uh, also a bumpy relationship. Uh, in the last book, you explained how uh, Taft was his protege. Uh, but how did Roosevelt's opinion of Taft change once his protege was president? Something I've observed in my limited knowledge of presidents is that they all tend to dislike one another. It seems to go with the territory. Ronald Reagan was a transparently nice man who kind of liked everybody because he wasn't particularly interested in anybody, so he liked everybody. <laughs> and Theodore Roosevelt loved everybody, had bon ami. But when they talked about one another, the hostility would come out. Reagan was astonishingly contemptuous of President Ford, President Carter, LBJ, and TR was like that about Taft. He loved him when he was Secretary of War in his cabinet. He called him Bill, my big, big, my big, my friend, Big Bill, Taft. But as soon as Taft became his hand-picked successor as president, T.R. began to chafe at the way Taft was conducting the office. He found him too conservative, too sluggish, anti-conservationist, and he began to want to get his office back and show Taft how to do it. So the relationship festered and became extremely acrimonious by 1912 to the point that they absolutely wouldn't talk to each other for years. There's a rather touching reconciliation scene toward the end when they were both much older and T.R. was beginning to ail. They met here in Chicago, as a matter of fact, quite by accident. In 1917, T.R. walked into the Blackstone Hotel dining room and there was Taft, who happened to be there. Taft stood up and said, Theodore! And everybody in the room applauded, and they sat down and had breakfast together. And from then on, it was as nothing had ever happened. And when the following year, or at least in January of 1919, T.R. died, Taft was the last person to stand at his grave after the ceremony. There, and he stood there in the snow for a long time, crying. Well, like Lincoln, we're bouncing around here. But uh, Teddy Roosevelt had a phenomenal memory, especially with his reading. Both Lincoln and uh, T.R. just ingested books and just became, became part of them. Uh, what did T.R. think about Lincoln? Now, we're, I'm, I'm putting us up here because uh, one president doesn't like another one. What about uh, T.R. with Lincoln? What did he feel about Lincoln? He's about the only president that he really loved and admired and revered detested Thomas Jefferson. I think he kind of admired Washington, but Lincoln, he revered, as everybody did, um, at least in the North, um, in the early years of the 20th century. Well, martyrdom helps, of course. Martyrdom helps a lot. Uh, his views of Lincoln were sentimental somewhat and conventional, but um, he was always beating the table with Lincoln, particularly pr during the Progressive Party campaign. He identified with Lincoln to an almost unseemly degree. Did he like uh, Lincoln use humor to make a point? Oh, yes. Stories? Yeah, he point. was a very funny man, T.R. He was a natural clown, and he, some of his letters are excruciatingly funny. Um, however, he didn't have Lincoln's brand of rather earthy humor. T.R. was rather prudish. Um, in, in, in humor. His, his humor is really a matter of um, a, his attitude to life and his own cheerful persona. He was aware of the fact that on the stump humor can be misunderstood, so his speeches tended to be rather serious. 
but in private he was the most delightful of men and he would have people rolling on the floor with laughter all the time. Well, he became friendly with uh, Robert Lincoln, the only son that Lincoln had, mm -hmm. uh, rose to maturity. Uh, now, let me ask you this then. If, who were his, who were TR's heroes and mentors? Whom did he look up to? He admired um, martial men, uh, commanders, generals, throughout history. He was um, fascinated, obsessed with naval and military strategy. And um, amongst presidents, for the military reasons, he admired Washington. I don't know if he was so crazy about Washington as an executive. But um, his writings are remarkably free of specific hero worship. He had such a large opinion of himself that um, he didn't have too much hero worship to spare for anybody <laughs> else. Now, he carried a bullet through, uh, through some of his life, just like uh, another president, Andy Jackson. Uh, did he ever talk about Andy Jackson in his letters or his thoughts? Not that I can recall. Um, now, let's talk about the progressive movement a bit. Why did, how and why did he turn uh, politically left toward the progressive movement? Did, was part of it the exclusion of the white middle class, as you mentioned, uh, uh, from the federal government? Did that play a part? What else did? Basically, it was an anti-corporate bias that he had viscerally inside him from his earliest days in politics. He was always um, distressed by the tendency of great business enterprises to grow and grow and become more and more unscrupulous unless they were controlled and regulated. So when he became president at a time when great corporations were becoming multinational, they called them the trusts, he felt it vitally important that the new president himself demonstrate to the United States that the federal government has executive power to regulate great unscrupulous monetary trusts. And that's what he did in the Northern Security Suit which despite the dissent of Oliver Wendell Holmes was successful and stamped forever on his presidency the image of regulatory authority. After that he was remarkably lenient with the trusts. He'd made his moral point and uh, he in fact bust far fewer trusts for the rest of his presidency than Taft did in his presidency. But this anti-corporate or this corporate control tendency of his mutated during his second term into this progressivism with a small p that articulated various regulatory philosophies. He believed that the courts should be subject to control by the people, that unpopular or unconstitutional uh, judicial decisions should be subject to review. Just popular like his, review. his cousin later on. Yeah, indeed. FDR. Yeah, These are radical ideas in his time. And they all matured in 1912 in the Progressive Party campaign um, platform, which was so far advanced for its time with its protection of workers and minorities, child labor, health legislation, uh, and many other aspects of social reform that many of his pr the provisions of that platform did not mature and were not enacted until the time of FDR, the New Deal. Yeah. The New Deal grew organically out of the Square Deal of Theodore Roosevelt. Yes. Exactly. Uh, now you write during that 1912 time, trying to go for the president, running for the presidency again. Uh, well, Ellie, uh, you write that he sensed the power he had would corrupt him. Did he fear his own ambitions that they might corrupt him? He was a man so deeply read. He read read on average a book a day every day of his life. That um, he was wise. He knew that power, indeed, power held too long, supreme power, inevitably corrupts. He was aware of that. It's entirely my own theory that he began to detect these germs in himself, but his behavior during the very last years of his presidency began to be arrogant. By then, he had become, he was exercising power so flawlessly. He was still so young and so vigorous, the youngest president we've ever had. He had all this erudition, all this uh, energy, that he began to be a little too much of an executive. And he made this mistake 
1906-1907, known as the Brownsville episode, when he dishonorably discharged an entire regiment of black soldiers in Brownsville, Texas, on allegations that they had rioted and caused a couple of deaths of the white population there. He summarily dismissed them without court-martial, without trial, without giving them any chance to plead their own case, even when it became transparently obvious that they had been framed by the citizens of Brownsville. He would never recant that decision. It was an arrogant decision where he was convinced he was right. And I suspect, although he never apologized for it, that incident told him that he'd had too much power too long and that he should give it up. And in a genuinely great gesture, he did give it up in 1908. Now, one thing about your book here that I really enjoyed are the footnotes. And I suggest to anyone who reads this, read the book, and then continue on into the footnotes and just read through that. There's so much information in there. Uh, He's a well, footnote fetishist. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. I even read the book on footnotes. Uh, well, one of the things was a lengthy footnote on him uh, uh, as a patron of the arts that you didn't have the time to really put in here. You even mentioned in that footnote that you think we need a book on that subject for uh, mm. Betty Roosevelt. Uh, but he was a major patron of the arts. Yes, ways. throughout his presidency. He, he, he uh, also architectural, where he, he placed the Lincoln Memorial where it is now, mm -hmm. uh, as an example. He added major collections to the Smithsonian, beautified Washington, restored and renamed the executive mansion, the White House. So he did a great deal of this. Gave us the most beautiful coinage that's ever been designed, mm -hmm. the St. Gordon's coins. And also the penny. And the penny, that's right. Victor David Brenner, he was sitting for a medal uh, with Brenner for the Panama Canal, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. And he uh, saw Brenner's 1907 plaque on uh, uh, Lincoln. I think Brenner was looking forward to 1909 and the centennial and something mm -hmm. he could sell. Uh, I don't know why anyone wanted to do that, but mm -hmm. we uh, So it's interesting. I didn't know saw that. that mm -hmm. And he he knew that Treasury was looking for both a new nickel and a penny. Mm -hmm. and, he, and they thought of the penny because it's the coin of the common man. So it was because of TR that we have the Brady photo that we do on the penny. What do you know? See, 30 years I've been writing about this guy. I didn't know that. <laughs> uh, I'll write my book on that. <laughs> uh, what are the hallmarks of great or at least successful presidents? Uh, what are the leadership qualities in that a president has to have. You've seen a couple of them now. Well, he said himself, um, my duty as president is to articulate the thoughts the American people have in their bosom but ca cannot express for themselves. He had to sense the national mood and express the national aspirations and desires. And I think all great presidents do that in their time. They express the, the zeitgeist, the feeling, the desires, the aspirations of the people. Well, we've been talking about the living man, uh, also on Face the Nation, I believe, or maybe it was Brian Lamb, one of the two. Uh, I heard you say that every biographer likes a good death scene, mm -hmm. and that uh, I think you must have, if not enjoyed, uh, enjoyed uh, writing uh, this death scene. What was it like after 30 years of living with him to now mm -hmm. write his death? Well, as you're right. Um, to write a good death scene, it's like actors love to play death scenes. I was aware that this death scene was a particularly poignant one. And I wrote it uh, almost um, without effort because I guess I'd been writing it in my head for many years. I certainly knew what the last line of the book would be because I discovered it almost after starting my first book 30 years ago. I was in a library of the Roosevelt House in New York and came across this file of schoolboy essays written shortly after T.R. died by the school children of the Cove School in Oyster Bay. And one of these little boys wrote a sentence, tribute to the late colonel, which was so simple and so beautifully expressive of everything he stood for. But 30 years ago, I said to myself, that will be the last line of the last book. And it is? Mm-hmm. 
and, and the line is? I've completely forgotten. <laughs> well, then I'm going to go in here. And don't you, you dare read that. I, should not read, I won't. You have to read the book to get to the last line and don't cheat. <laughs> and keep well, your thumb over it. You know, um, it's hell of a number of people assessing Teddy Roosevelt in this last book. Uh, Cecil Spring Rice said, you must always remember that the president is about six. Mm -hmm. Mark Twain said that Roosevelt was clearly insane. Mm -hmm. Other notables said the greatest man in the Western Hemisphere, the greatest moral force of the age. Uh, for you, which assessment is closest to the truth? All of them? None of them? I'll tell you the one I've always liked the most. It was John L. Sullivan, the great heavyweight boxer who was the great buddy of the president's. And he said after T.R. died, he was the greatest president that ever flopped himself down in the White House chair. And if you want to quote me, just say that John L. Sullivan says, the Almighty played an, a, an awful trick on the Irish when he made Theodore Roosevelt a Dutchman. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have here a, a piece of ephemera, a postcard, uh, that illustrates uh, Roosevelt's populist appeal among ex-Confederates. Mm -hmm. Confederate soldiers. It's a printed postcard inviting members in May of 1905, during his presidency, meeting of the Nathan Bedford Forest Camp of the United Confederate Veterans. This is in Chattanooga. Mm -hmm. uh, now he's, car he's caricatured holding a smoking rifle labeled TR on the stock and surrounded by six dead bears and at the bottom reads, we're something on killing bars ourselves. <laughs> so an association of Confederate cavalrymen uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest and the Brahmin Roosevelt is interesting. Um, perhaps it reflects individualism and self-reliance that they themselves believe they, they perceived in both men and uh, therefore here's Roosevelt. What was his populist image during the presidency and how did it change afterward? Or did it? Well the bar of course was a large part of his image, the teddy bear. Um, like you said, I can't bring one out. So I didn't I'm that. rather glad you didn't. Yes. Teddy bears are the bane of my life. <laughs> I wrote in Theodore Rex a description of how the teddy bear got its name, and at the end of the note I said, with this note the author retires from the field of teddy bear studies. <laughs> <laughs> well, what was his legacy? What, what did he feel his legacy was? His legacy, his great legacy, which is apparent to us now, was the conservationist legacy. The fact that he almost individually and alone put on the map, put into the American lexicon the word conservation. The notion that our natural resources are finite and are being eroded as we stand and look at them and they had to be preserved for future generations. And he, he, he trumpeted that theme with such passion throughout his presidency and he personally set aside if necessary, by executive order, such enormous areas of the United States for permanent preservation. National monuments, national parks, uh, national wildlife refuges and all the rest. That the further he recedes in history, the greater that achievement seems to be. Uh, we have questions coming in from, uh, from Webland. Uh, the question here is, uh, this is a Sheldon from Chicago. I guess I was wrong about where Sheldon was. Were his views and practices about what were his views and practices about racism here in the United States? It's a long and complex question, which I'll try and be succinct in answering. He had the traditional prejudices of his class and his time. He regarded the white race as superior. The educated patrician white um, aristocracy that he represented was his idea of the, the governing class. But he was no means, by no means the fanatical racist that um, Henry Adams was or many of his other friends. He had a comparatively enlightened attitude to race for a man of his type and, t and kind. For example, when he became president, the very first person he asked to consult with him in the White House was Booker T. Washington, who was the leader of, the, of, of black America. And T.R. throughout his life said that he regarded Dr. Washington as one of the greatest men he'd ever known. He invited Washington to have dinner with him in the White House within three weeks of, of, of moving in. First time a black man had ever sat down at the same table with the President of the United States and his family. 
and it created such a firestorm of paranoid rage across the white south that TR never re repeated the experiment. But he remained on good terms with Washington for the rest of his presidency. However, when he ran for the presidency on the progressive ticket, he made a decision to exclude black southerners from membership of the party for complex reasons which he thought were in their interest. But ever since, that single act of exclusion has tarred him with um, a brush that um, has redounded to his discredit mm. subsequently. Even though I think that the explanation he gives of his conduct, in, uh, which I quote at length in Colonel Roosevelt, is plausible and persuasive. Yes, I, I thought so too, actually, and, and I felt uh, better about it. Uh, your man that way. I'm going to put you to work for a few moments because before we end we're getting very close. If you just uh, begin to sign these for us while I thank some of the people out there who have uh, purchased books from us. Uh, Bob in Chicago, Doug in Louisville, Mike and Paulette, Vermont, Vermont, Teresa in Galloway, Ohio, The Outdoors and Strenuous Life, but was there a marketing aspect to that? No, oh, he's a very, sh a very shrewd self-marketer, yes indeed. Uh, he came out with phrases, political catchphrases by the dozen. The strenuous life, big, speak soft in, carry a big stick, um, molly coddles, um, the lunatic fringe. He wrote a letter to Amos Pinchot, this very radical member of the Progressive Party. Dear sir, when I spoke of the Progressive Party as having a lunatic fringe, I had specifically you in mind. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you a question from out here, so because I'd like to try to get as many as I can from our email. I can't get to all of you, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, John Davison has asked, uh, because uh, it was your first tri biography when you began to research and write The Rise of Theodore Roosevelt, and really as it needed three volumes, did you ever doubt your commitment or ability to finish the project? No, I didn't, no. no, I, no. Think so. I had such a good subject on you, I could stay with it till the end. And uh, someone asked a quick question. I have Pringle's book, by the way, that you mentioned in first edition with uh, Dust Jacket at home. Mm -hmm. I almost brought it in because it is in your book as well. Mm. But uh, I don't know if you want to do this, but do you have a view on Bradley's recent book on Teddy Roosevelt, The Imperial Cruise? Uh, this gentleman, whoever, or lady, I don't know who, who this was, didn't sign it, thought it was a rather weak premise, that whatever that was. Yeah, it would have helped if he'd read a few books before he wrote his own. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, T.R. was aware in the mid-1890s that Japan was an imperial threat. In fact, he set, a, he set a strategic essay for the students of the Naval War College. Japan makes attack on the Hawaiian Islands. What does the United States do? That's in the 1890s. Mm -hmm. And although he profoundly, profoundly admired the Japanese throughout his presidency, and in fact mediated that war, um, he was always aware of the fact that they were a future imperialistic threat. Yes, ma'am. Um, congratulations on winning the Pulitzer. Oh, and thank I you. I wondered if you would share with us some of the circumstances around the winning of the prize and what it means to you. Well, naturally it's a thrill, but um, I, I heard about it in the New York Public Library. I got a phone call. This guy came up and said, this Associated Press is calling. He said, this voice said, how do you feel about winning the Pulitzer Prize, Mr. Morris? So naturally, I wanted to rush home and tell my wife, which I did. And uh, when the doorman to our building heard from me as I rushed through, I said, I won the Pulitzer Prize. He, for the first time in years, began to treat me with the respect. <laughs> <laughs> and the respect lasted for a few weeks, but he began to look more, more and more puzzled, and eventually he said to me, when are you going to get the prize? I said, oh, I already got it. They just send it to you in the mail with a thousand bucks. It's no big deal. He said, but the king of Sweden? I said, that's the Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> All these prizes do sound alike. Uh, well, again, we thank Random House for bringing you in. Edmund Morris, thank you for being here. This was great fun. We appreciate all of you uh, who watched as well. Uh, Colonel Roosevelt, I think you will find a fascinating book. It just will sweep you through. Uh, I have to stop and write down questions for you, unfortunately, So, but I may go back and just let myself be swept through. And we do have some of uh, Theodore Rex left as well, if you'd like to have 
that side we'll have him sign those as well i thank the staff from abraham lincoln bookshop as always for making this possible and all of you thanks do come back again good night